So we're going to talk about small biopsies that have a variable appearance as well as ameloblastoma. So the diagnostic dilemma here is that with small biopsy material, some of our histologic variants can be misleading. Also, inflammation has a tendency to obscure histologic features, particularly in some of our tumor types. And then lastly, there are multiple tumors that can have ameloblastic type epithelium, and this can be a diagnostic pitfall. So with ameloblastoma, we have several types, we have different growth patterns, and we also have histologic variants. So we will discuss these. So our ameloblastoma is quote unquote a benign neoplasm. That being said, it can be aggressive. It's usually asymptomatic in nature, presenting as a bony swelling, and the mean age of presentation is about 30 years. Usually we don't see it before the age of 20. The classic anatomic location is the posterior mandible angle, and it presents with a history of slow growth, but it is locally invasive in nature. Radiographically, it's well circumscribed. Usually it's a multilocular radiolucency. That being said, smaller lesions, early lesions, may be unilocular in nature. These multilocular radiolucencies can be a soap bubble or honeycomb in appearance, as far as the descriptor goes. The growth pattern is going to be buccal-lingual in nature, and it can resorb the roots of teeth or displace the roots. And it can arise in association with a impacted tooth, and so the differential diagnosis could include something like a dentigerous cyst. So here we see an ameloblastoma. This is a gross resection specimen. And what we can see here is that there is indeed blunting or resorption of the roots. And this tooth is starting to tip a bit, um, so it's been displaced by the pressure of the ameloblastoma. This is what we would call multilocular, and so we can see a septa here, a septa there, um, and so uh, the, uh, the lucency that we're seeing in the bone here is from the ameloblastoma. You can see that it is growing in that buccal lingual um, growth dimension, and we can see that it is expanding the cortex of the mandible. So, as far as the main patterns that we see, um, follicular would be the most common that we're going to see in the mandible. And so we see this large nest here, and at the uh, here's the basal cell layer, and we see what we call reverse polarity, where these columnar cells, the nuclei, are polarized away from that basement membrane. The other pattern that we'll see is plexiform. This would be more commonly seen in the maxilla. So here we see this dense fibrous stroma. Uh, we see this epithelium here and these interconnecting kind of bands of epithelium. So we said this is invasive. And so here is bone and here is this follicular pattern. Uh, but within the follicles themselves, um, the stellate reticulum is undergoing cystic degeneration. We can see this on a macroscopic level over here in this rese resection specimen. And so this is why we don't make the call of unicystic ameloblastoma unless we have the entire specimen in front of us, uh, because the cystic degeneration within an ameloblastoma can be quite impressive. So as far as the different histologic variants of ameloblastoma, so we often can see these in combination. So one of these is a granular cell variant. And this is from lysosomal aggregates. And so we here, so here we see more conventional ameloblastoma with that peripheral palisading. But then here we start to see this granular cell change. And so that brings us to case number four. We have a 33-year-old male who presents with a multilocular radiolucency in the right angle of the mandible. We see that follicular pattern. We do see some cystic degeneration. And then we see this more eosinophilic pink areas. Here at higher power, we do see that there has been this granular cell change within it. So it's kind of mixed follicular granular cell variant. And so our final diagnosis is ameloblastoma. And so by definition, kind of conventionally, when we say ameloblastoma, we're referring to that conventional solid multicystic ameloblastoma if we don't say otherwise. But this is a granular cell variant. That doesn't bear, though, any significance for the patient treatment or prognosis. Another variant is the acanthomatous variant. So here we do see a bit of peripheral palisading at the edges of the island. But we also see um, keratin pearls or uh, squamoid change in the center of these islands. 
And so that's what we see in the acanthomatous variant. Um, so this represents about 12% of our ameloblastomas. We also see that fibrocellular uh, stroma here. So moving on to another variant of ameloblastoma. The clinical features of the desmoplastic variant of ameloblastoma are unique. Which of the following is incorrect about desmoplastic ameloblastoma? Is the distribution between the maxilla and the mandible nearly equal? Radiographically, are they either unilocular or multilocular radiolucencies? Are they more common in the anterior jaws? Or grossly, do they have a gritty consistency on sectioning, a frozen ice cream consistency? And the one that is incorrect is actually that radiographically, they are not unilocular or multilocular. These are actually mixed density lesions. And that's because you, they do indeed have a gritty consistency on sectioning. Uh, they're unique in the sense that they do have an equal distribution between the maxilla and the mandible. Uh, whereas most of our ameloblastomas are seen more commonly uh, in the posterior. And so these are more common in the fact that they are seen in the anterior jaws and uh, equal between the maxilla and the mandible, and they do have a gritty consistency. And this is an example of a dysmoplastic ameloblastoma. And you see how the islands of epithelium are somewhat crushed. We do see this kind of blue mixoid um, appearance in the stroma surrounding the islands. Here's another example. Um, so we see that they are stroma rich and um, kind of epithelium poor, but here we do see kind of a classic, more follicular island. And so usually if you hunt about, you can see that um, somewhere uh, within the lesion. Uh, but these are one of our more tricky ameloblastomas. And then also radiographically, they don't have that classic appearance. And this is at higher power. So here you can see a bit of that peripheral palisading uh, but it's certainly not as classic. Again, here we can see a bit of that peripheral palisading as well. Also here, perhaps, uh, but they're not, not as easy to make the diagnosis. Um, you could also do um, immunohistochemistry to help you, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, one more view. But this is a radiograph of a desmoplastic ameloblastoma. It's uh, kind of classic for desmoplastic ameloblastoma. Um, so if you were to get this from a surgeon, um, their differential might be quite different um, as far as what they were expecting it to be. And so desmoplastic ameloblastoma represents 4 to 13 percent of all ameloblastomas. They're the rarest of the variants, and the one that uh, looks at least ameloblastic is your basal cell variant. And this is 1 to 2 percent of your ameloblastomas. And this might also kind of scare you a bit because the proliferative index is going to be the highest. So the highest KI67 is seen in the um, basal cell variant of a ameloblastoma. Um, and so you might be starting to think about an atypical ameloblastoma or ameloblastic carcinoma uh, because if you hunt around, you might be seeing um, mitotic figures within the lesion. Uh, but it's got more strands and cords. It's certainly more blue. Um, and so it is palisading in its own kind of unique way, um, so it is a very different look of a ameloblastoma. So here it is on a higher power. Um, so kind of a different nuclear feature as well. So two different signaling pathways that come into play for a ameloblastoma, the hedgehog pathway um, with smoothened, and then also the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway where we have a single amino acid substitution that leads to constitutive activation. And so normally we have RAS that activates um, BRAF and that leads to a phosphorylation uh, cascade. And MAP kinase pathway is important in a number of malignancies such as colorectal cancer, uh, melanoma, even thyroid cancer. Um, but BRAF mutations have been found to be um, they're in about 70% of our ameloblastomas, and it's an independent predictor of recurrence-free survival. And these patients are frequently younger, about two decades younger. But also, um, this mutation is associated with cortical expansion and the follicular pattern. But actually, that does make sense because the follicular pattern is more frequently seen in your mandibular ameloblastomas. Um, BRAF and RAS family mutations are mutually exclusive. BRAF and smoothen mutations are usually mutually exclusive. There is good concordance between IHC and molecular testing. Um, and that recurrence rate, the recurrence rate correlates with mutational burden. Um, that being said, um, so patients that have two to three 
um, mutations are more likely to have a higher rate of um, recurrence. So here's a patient uh, with um, a ameloblastoma, a somewhat uh, follicular, but a little bit more hypercellular. Uh, but here is a BRAF immunohistochemistry, and you can see that it is indeed nicely positive, and this was a mandibular ameloblastoma. So I said BRAF is mutually exclusive with the other RAS family mutations, and so you see patients either have one or indeed the other. So it's interesting though, um, we used to think that patients that had maxillary ameloblastomas did worse because it was harder to get negative surgical margins. Um, now what we think is that perhaps it's because they have a different mutational profile. So while BRAF is most common in your mandibular ameloblastomas, the most common mutation that we see in our maxillary ameloblastomas is actually smoothened, with the next most common mutation being RAS. So what about BRAF in our other um, odontogenic tumors? Well, about 40% of our ameloblastic fiber odontomas and ameloblastic fibromas have uh, BRAF mutations. Uh, whereas our unicystic ameloblastomas and our peripheral ameloblastomas have similar rates of um, BRAF mutations as our uh, conventional solid multicystic ameloblastomas. What about ameloblastic carcinoma? Um, so Keith will be talking to you about our endogenic malignancies. Well, it seems to be that um, our ameloblastic carcinomas actually have um, a much lower rate of uh, BRAF mutation. So it seems to be something else is um, driving our maloblastic carcinomas. And that does make sense because BRAF mutations actually um, are associated with a better prognosis in a maloblastoma. So kind of switching gears here to obscured histologic features on biopsy. So here's a 15-year-old who presents with asymptomatic unilocular cystic lesion that's causing expansion and root resorption. And so we can see the root resorption both on the first molar and the second molar. And there's no cortical perforation as reported by the surgeon. And the surgeon report, uh, aspirated straw-colored fluid. The surgeon's differential diagnosis is a dentigerous cyst. And so if it's a dentigerous cyst, it's coming from this third molar, or a KCOT. And KCOTs have kind of anterior-posterior growth, whereas um, ameloblastomas are more likely to have buccolingual growth. So here's the biopsy. It's inflamed. It's kind of squamoid-ish. And so here's our biopsy. And then here is a dentigerous cyst that I showed you before. And so going back, you know, it, perhaps you might want to call it a dentigerous cyst, but I told you before, a dentigerous cyst connects at the level of the cemento enamel junction. And if you look here, well, this cyst really isn't connecting at the level of cemento enamel junction. Um, but we're pathologists, we're not radiologists. Um, and so there are times when we need to weasel, waffle, hedge. And this is one of those times. This is a 15 year old and we were given a tiny little incisional biopsy. We we're also given a terrible radiograph. And this just doesn't look classic. Um, and this doesn't really fit with the perfect dentigerous cyst. And this is resorbing roots. And so as soon as you have a lesion that's resorbing roots, that's unusual. And that's something you're gonna see um, in more aggressive cases. And you don't have the whole lesion in front of you. You just have an incisional biopsy. And so here's the waffle. Here's the the hedge, a donogenic cyst inflamed. And so we pull out a donogenic cyst inflamed when we're, we're not ready to commit to a definitive diagnosis. We say we're unable to determine if the cyst is inflammatory or developmental in nature. The lining is inflamed, and that can uh, distort the appearance of a developmental cyst. A review of a better quality radiograph would be helpful, and clinical correlation is required. All right, so then we get the excisional biopsy. And lo and behold, we do indeed have buccal lingual expansion. And it doesn't really look like it is connecting at that cemento enamel junction. Perhaps it's a bit hobnaily, but now it looks like we have some stellate reticulum. And we decide we're gonna do BRAF uh, B600E immunohistochemistry. And this isn't actually the best area of this uh, particular cyst, 
Uh, but it turns out that this is indeed a um, unicystic ameloblastoma. And so we don't make the call of a unicystic ameloblastoma until we have the entire lesion. We don't call unicystic ameloblastomas on incisional biopsies. Um, we might say we're favoring it, uh, but we, uh, at least at our institution, never make the call without the entire lesion. So this though, and this is the same case, um, we have areas like this and we have areas like this. And so these certainly um, are quite classic and good for unicystic ameloblastoma. And so if we had this initially, um, we probably would have put that in the comment, uh, but we probably would not have committed uh, because uh, we would have been worried that what if there were areas um, that were more solid multicystic and what if we just had areas of cystic degeneration. So the reason it's an important distinction is that it differs, differs from conventional ameloblastoma in both the treatment and the prognosis. Um, so these patients are younger by about a decade and uh, clinically, this can resemble a dentigerous cyst, a primordial cyst, a residual cyst, uh, but these are going to be radiographically unilocular. These aren't multilocular radio uh, radiographically. These often are surrounding the crown of an uninterrupted third molar, but there are subtle differences radiographically. So to the surgeon, this is a cyst. There are different types of this. Um, so luminal, intraluminal. And in intraluminal, you've got these growths of epithelium within the lumen. But as soon as you start to get um, epithelium that's growing into that connective tissue wall, um, then it needs to be treated um, with a margin or you need to treat it with closer follow-up. And so it's important to tell your surgeon when they have a mural type of unicystic ameloblastoma. And so this is the luminal type. Oops. Um, so here we have kind of that stellate reticulum, um, but here we do have kind of a bit of peripheral palisading. You wouldn't expect this, this type of, I'll call it a bit more proliferative. You wouldn't expect this type of architecture with something like a dentigerous cyst. And this is actually a nice place for BRAF E600E immunohistochemistry. Uh, remember about, this is going to be more common in the mandible, and in the mandible you're more likely to have uh, BRAF uh, mutations, and so this is a great place uh, where we do use BRAF IHC. So usually this is a retrospective diagnosis, um, so the surgeon isn't always expecting this beforehand, and so the diagnosis is re revealed after microscopy. But if it's luminal or intraluminal, enucleation curatage is adequate. Um, if it's mural, then uh, they can either go back and resect it or they can uh, follow it up more closely. Recurrence rate's about 10 to 20%, and that's versus, you know, 70% plus uh, for conventional ameloblastomas if it was treated with enucleation curatage um, alone. So another case, this is a 67-year-old, and there is a large multilocular radiolucency in the mandible. So this is pretty extensive. It's kind of going from midline all the way to the second molar, so huge multilocular radiolucency. And you get two little biopsies. So you get this fragment, and it's obviously briskly inflamed. Got histiocytes in the midst of it. We'll look at these two areas. This is somewhat squamoid. Hard to make a definitive diagnosis on this particular piece. Here, briskly inflamed. A little bit of separation here, which should kind of catch your attention, the fact that this epithelium is separating away. But again, hard to make a diagnosis on this. Uh, but you should be aware, if you look in retrospect, this, this should be more, uh, more useful than it is at the moment. But here's the other fragment. And now probably you know the diagnosis. And so here we do have separation, a hyperchromatic palisaded basal cell layer, wavy surface parakeratin, and now you know we're dealing with a cryocystic adonogenic tumor.
And so my point here is that uh, one thing we need to be aware of is that inflammation obscures the features um, of a OKC or KCOT. And so in retrospect, um, it is easier to kind of pick up that this is KCOT in this particular area, uh, but you need to be aware that inflammation can be a pitfall in your KCOTs. And so particularly if you have a lesion that was that large, um, you need to know when to waffle and when not to commit and when to say that your biopsy may not be representative. And we're going to finish off by talking about tumors with ameloblastic epithelium. So certainly in your developing tooth, you have the ameloblast, and the ameloblasts are responsible for the secretion of enamel. And then next to them, we have our stellate reticulum. And so these are obviously two features that we see in our ameloblastoma, uh, but they're also two features of our developing teeth. We have our peripheral ameloblastoma. And so here we have our normal surface epithelium, and then here we have ameloblastic islands that marry up. Um, so this obviously has ameloblastic epithelium, um, and the difference in this distinction between this and conventional ameloblastoma, and this is treated with local excision um, down to the level of the periosteum with negative margins. We have our ameloblastic fibroma. So this is, has this primitive mesenchymal kind of mixoid type stroma, and then we have small strands and islands of epithelium that are ameloblastic in nature. These are pediatric lesions um, that we do see in the posterior. Um, so these patients are going to be younger. Um, the stroma is very characteristic in these particular lesions. Uh, but versus large resections that have one to one and a half centimeter margins, uh, like we see in ameloblastomas, these can be treated with a more conservative uh, excision with negative margins. So you don't need these larger oncologic type um, excisions for ameloblastic fibromas. And so that brings us to our case five. And this is a 12 year old with a slow growing expansile lesion of the left mandible. Um, and so this is radiolucent on imaging. And so this particular stroma is a bit revved up. It's a little more cellular. You may see um, a few scattered mitotic figures if you look around the stroma but it's not sufficient to call it a myeloblastic fibrosarcoma. So we do have our islands of a myeloblastic epithelium, but we also have this primitive mesenchymal stroma. And so this case was an myeloblastic fibroma. Another uh, tumor that does have a myeloblastic epithelium is our calcifying cystic adonogenic tumor. And so here we see strands of ameloblastic epithelium, but we also have ghost cells within it. And those ghost cells are going to calcify and makes this a mixed density lesion. So here again, we see our ameloblastic epithelium, we see our ghost cells, and we see our calcification. So just something to be aware of, that our calcifying cystic adonogenic tumor, one of the diagnostic criteria for this particular tumor, is also a myeloblastic epithelium. Our adenomatoid adonogenic tumor. This is another lesion that has a myeloblastic epithelium within it. Um, and so we'll see duct-like structures. We will see whorls. We actually will see amyloid within this particular lesion, and that amyloid will start to calcify, uh, giving us mineralization. And so this is another lesion that has ameloblastic type epithelium within it. Our primordial adonogenic tumor has ameloblastic epithelium, and this actually will rim the edge of this tumor. So this is a relatively new tumor um, that was recently described, recently included in the WHO Blue Book. Um, we see it in the posterior molar area. And within it, we see kind of this primitive mixoid dental papilla-like tissue. And it's surrounded by this rim of ameloblastic epithelium. It's called a tumor, but there is no described occurrences of this lesion. And there really have only been a handful of these uh, reported. Another very rare one is our adonto ameloblastoma. 
So it's got cords of ameloblastic epithelium that run through it. Um, it has this primitive kind of mesenchymal pulp-like stroma. And then you get areas of hard tissue mineralization, hence the odonto component. So summary and take homes. So particularly with small biopsies, unusual histologic variants or subtypes of ameloblastoma can be problematic. Also, um, in some of our lesions, inflammation can obscure our histologic features. That's particularly true in our KCOT. Uh, we can see um, our unicystic ameloblastoma becoming a difficult diagnosis. And then it's worth being aware that we have many adontogenic neoplasms that have ameloblastic epithelium within them. And it's important to distinguish these from our conventional ameloblastoma given how aggressive conventional ameloblastoma is treated with one to one and a half centimeter margins.